This is the Flying Circle. I'd like to welcome everybody. My name is Mike Elgin. And um, on this Flying Circle is the legendary Bones Brigade. Uh, you want to, to introduce yourselves, or would you like me to introduce you? Um, I'm Stacy. I'm okay. Ron. I'm Steve Caballero. Steve? Caballero. Mike McGill. Lance Mount. And Tony, Tony Hawk from Australia. Okay. So here's what's happening. We have a, a movie premiere in Santa Barbara. Uh, this is the West Coast premiere for the Bones Brigade at the Santa Barbara International Film Festival. Uh, this movie is uh, just rocked um, Sundance, and the reviews are overwhelmingly positive. In fact, I don't think I've seen a single uh, review that was negative in any way, um, which is amazing. One uh, reviewer called it the coolest documentary he, he's ever seen. And uh, it's now going to be uh, showing at the, in Santa Barbara. Uh, and eventually, the rest of us will get to, to see it. We'll get to that in a little while. But the Bones Brigade was, for those of you who are not uh, skaters or um, uh, into the skating world, was the most influential uh, skate group, uh, as far as I can tell. You guys can correct me if I'm wrong. Ever, this, uh, these guys uh, in the 80s reinvented the sport, were incredibly influential. And not just invented the sport, but invented uh, many of the moves and tricks that, that skaters uh, t today still rely on as the, as the mainstay of their, uh, of their skating. Um, now, this is the first Google Plus Hangout ever done, as far as I'm aware of, in, in association with a movie uh, premiere or movie uh, uh, film festival or anything like that. So this we're making a little bit of history here. Uh, um, and um, so... I'd like to um, start um, by just um, pointing out that Stacy, in the lower right-hand corner, for those of you watching, is the filmmaker. And he himself was one of the uh, world's first professional skaters. And then he went on to uh, form the Bones Brigade and was essentially what passed as adult supervision for a bunch of really young teenagers at the time. A and, um, and then he went on to become a filmmaker. So I, I, to a certain extent, I guess this... Uh, documentary was inevitable. You have a, 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 a filmmaker, and uh, the, the word autobiography um, says a lot about uh, the fact that Stacy is both the filmmaker and and the one of the one of the heroes and protagonists of the movie. Um, and and it's not the first time he's he's uh, done that as well. And we'll get into that later. So, okay. So I've been I've been uh, promoting the the hell out of this thing for about a week now. And the, my audience, I uh, have lots and lots of people all over the world who follow me on Google+, Plus, uh, falls into the following categories. We have the hardcore fans who are just frothing in the mouth to see this hangout and this movie. Uh, I've got a lot, a lot of people who recognize all your names um, and know, you know, have some awareness of, of who you guys are and are looking forward to this movie to find out what, where, where you guys all came from and, and, and why you guys are... Are, are well known. And then there's lots and lots of people, not just in the US, but all over the world, who just are not aware of, um, of the skating world and who, who really um, are interested in this thing as a, as a cultural phenomenon that they themselves have not participated in. Uh, and many of those are technologists, because this is Google Plus, and right now there's a lot of, a lot of geeks and a lot of Google people and Silicon Valley people on, on this. So I'd like to start, again, talking a little bit about skating. And then we'll get into the movie. But um, there's a technology angle to skating uh, that, in the sense that the technology of polyurethane wheels made, it, made the sport as it exists today possible. Is that, is that fair to say? Yes, it made modern skating possible. The urethane wheel was invented, I think, in 1973. Yeah. That's worthy. Yeah. Okay. And, my skate shop. Yeah. And <laughs> before that, we were riding what was considered clay wheels that were very similar to rocks. And the urethane wheel is the comparison between a Conestoga wagon and a radial tire. Yeah, and, and I actually remember when... I'm sorry, go ahead, Stacey. It made it possible to suddenly ride surfaces and um, vertical surfaces and things like that that you could never really do before because it basically was a health hazard um, with the way skateboard, skateboard products used to be made. But the urethane wheel not only was the great invention, but it spawned the invention of better boards, better trucks, and the entire skateboarding revolution. So, so in that sense, it's a lot like Silicon Valley companies where technology makes something possible and then media makes it uh, this huge phenomenon and, and a global phenomenon. I mean, 
nowadays you can see you can flip around the channels and you see you see professional skating all over the place. You see skate parks in every town. Uh, it's just a, a massive global phenomenon. Now, um, in the 70s, uh, Stacy, when you uh, when you were a pro skater, none of that existed, right? I mean, there was just it was just um, swimming pools and sidewalks, and and the, it was kind of an outlaw rebel kind of a thing. Well, the thing. Is it had become popular very briefly in the 60s for two years, and then it completely died out. When I grew up skateboarding. I didn't know if anybody outside of my own community skateboarded anywhere on the planet. It was like growing up on the moon. And if we did see other skateboarders, it was like seeing a tribe from like a faraway mountain or a valley. And it wasn't until 74, 75 when the wheel was invented that it gave other kids all over the country a chance to get involved in this sport. And hence you have these guys you know, here. Um, they came of age when skateboarding was just starting to itself come of age. And these guys are, they were given the opportunity to step up and become some of the greatest architects of skateboarding because when they started it, it was such a blank canvas. Now, it seems to me that there's a certain amount of irony about the success of, of this group because, you know, I think a lot of skaters get into it initially um, because it's, you know, they don't do it for money, fame, or attention, or you know, if they wanted to join a team, they join the baseball team. They want to do something that's solitary to a certain extent, and yet th this activity that's uh, that was pursued as you know, you know, young teenagers uh, became the opposite of all of that. It became uh, you know, money, fame, attention, all of that stuff all came with with the uh, uh, skate stardom. It's kind of ironic. Well, it came with the guys that did well, but it didn't come for all of them. I mean. Yeah. Do you guys want to address that, the stardom aspect? I mean, was that why you guys were doing this? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't, that was never really an option for us. To, I mean, the, the, you didn't aspire to become rich or famous because no one had ever done that. I think uh, the only inspiration really was that maybe you could get your picture in a magazine, and that kind of was enough for everyone, but it was more just about the community and the and the sharing of ideas and and doing something new. Now the, the the Bones Brigade is a is a from what I understand is a an interesting group. You've got a lot of very different personalities uh, in this group. And and Stacy, when you formed the group, was that I mean, were you just picking the best skaters, or were you um, or were you putting together a kind of a, a, a collection of personalities? I, I mean, the, each guy's personality certainly played into it. There were other skaters that it, at times were, you know, equally as good as the guys on my team, but I might, they might not have had the personality fit on the team. But what I was really looking for is I was looking for unusual talent. And every guy on this team seemed to have a very unusual talent. But also what I was trying to do was build a team of unknowns because these guys started writing for me before they ever became known. And that was not the way things were typically done in skateboarding. Typically you'd start a company and you would rip off um, pros from other people's teams. This was a group of guys that started skating for me when they were like 14 years of age before they had ever even become professional. And so we all started out, they all started out as amateurs under this Bones Brigade umbrella mm -hmm. with the idea that they would someday become professional skateboarders if there was a professional market, mm -hmm. but at the time that there really wasn't. We're talking about 1979, 1980, 81, 82, 83, 84, a time when skateboarding was very, very, um, it, it kind of disappeared for the second time. Mm -hmm. And that's when these guys all got their start, and it's when they started, you know, their rise. And it wasn't until 86, 85, 86 that the sport started to pick up, and hence they began to develop careers and get paid and start traveling all over the world. But when we were going around in my car in the early 80s, and it was slim pickings. I mean, there was nothing to be had except the camaraderie that we all had together and with other teams and things like that. Skateboarding was a very, very small, tiny little industry, and no one on the outside in, of skateboarding gave a rat's ass about it. Yeah, which has changed uh, quite a bit. Uh, now, um, Can I add one more thing? Please. At the same time that was happening... You have people like Rodney who invents in 1983 the all the flatland ollie, which will turn out to be later on in the, in, in the decade the most important trick in skateboarding. Sure. 
got Mike McGill in 1985 inventing the 540 or the McTwist. Mm -hmm. So they invented some of the most revolutionary maneuvers really early on in skateboarding's history at a time when it was, um, you know, there was maybe a thousand kids in the country that were doing it, two thousand kids. That's incredible. And what's it like to walk down the street and see a pack of, of skaters doing tricks you invented when you were their age? <laughs> it is, I guess, to some degree, to a large degree, there's, well, no, to a smaller degree. It's a sense of pride. To a greater degree, it's a, it's a sense of connection that you feel you contributed. Most skaters, I think, have a tendency to feel a little like outsiders. We don't play team sports. We do what we do alone. A lot of that is flatly illegal in terms of street skating at least. So you, you tend to want to run away from people and hit spots at night, etc. And so when you roll around and you see people doing what you do in the magazines and those references toward you, it's this incredible feeling of connectedness. And though you mentioned something before about um, the media and how that's changed things, and I didn't want to, I don't want to jump so much to present because this is more historical stuff. But, but in the beginning, there were just magazines, and we were all spread apart, and we didn't have much sense of community. And that is something that rapidly changed. This, the team itself, when we were, when Stacy brought us t together, that was an incredible motive force for us, to see, not only to look at what I belong to in terms of motivation, but look at what these guys are doing. And if, even if they weren't doing something that was necessarily directly related to it, it gave you that sense of, wow, I can, uh, he's pioneering what he's doing, I have to do it too. I see that, I can believe that, because look at how far ahead he is. And that only grows into what we have today through a lot of what we see on YouTube, etc. It unites the community. So, Rodney, I, I'm curious, um, you know, obviously you guys are all incredible athletes. Um, that's obvious watching you skate, but... Uh, in your case, Rodney, do you consider yourself uh, more of an athlete or more of an artist? Thank you. Um, the way skateboarding is, yes, we all have to have certain skill sets when it comes to you know, good balance, a degree of toughness, etc. But, but I think what it is is more the degree to which you stand out as an individual, how strongly you individuate yourself by what you do. That comes from more from... I guess what you call an artist from that perspective. It's, a, it's more of a form of expression than anything else. And the athletic part is more or less of the hurdle, I think. Mm -hmm. Now, we, I was trying to tie together... <laughs> I have always tried to figure that out. He just answered that for me. I have never... Can we run that? <laughs> yes. No, that's, really, that, that's a really important answer that I've never, I've never been able to articulate myself. Um, skaters, uh, skaters remind me a, a little bit of, of uh, hackers and, and, and technologists in the sense that really what, what, what software hackers do is they figure out, painstakingly figure out very, very difficult problems, and they do it for the intrinsic joy of it. They do it not for any external rewards, but they do it for the pure joy of figuring out and learning and mastering something. And it seems to me that the creation of tricks, because, I mean, it, it, if you think about tricks is, uh, as, as, as creations, as, as the objects of creation, it, it's kind of like a, a, a code that other skaters will emulate, build upon. It's a lot like software. There's also a, a, a similar kind of anti-authority strain in, in both hacking and, and skating cultures. <laughs> and is, is that a reasonable view or is that just my own bias because I'm into technology. Not at all. That is such a good analogy. If anything, I'm, I, I love Linux. And the open source community, is, it's so much like the open source community. And it's funny, if skaters, or when they do, when they nerd out at that level, I just think of Linux community, it's, it's extremely similar to the skateboard community for just what you say. And the elegance with which they do and the pride they take in that in the way it shares and becomes open to all of us where we build and share for, from one another's work. It's exactly the same. But, but there's also something else that skateboarding has, and you might be able to address this after my, my bit, Tommy, is that skateboarding is illegal in most places that we do it. It's illegal in the street. And so you're constantly taught to look over your shoulder, to know when to be somewhere and when not to be somewhere, to recognize who might want you out of there. And so you learn to be very crafty, and you learn to operate, I don't want to say in an illegal manner, 
but you do operate in an illegal manner. And yeah. so you learn certain street smarts while you're practicing your craft. I mean, and you share them. Well, I mean, that's where you grow up. It's, it's, yeah, it's just survival, you know. Um, you nurture these instincts based on, you know, what's going on around you, your environment, and what you're trying to do at that moment in time. You know, you, you know you have, okay, we have 30 seconds it takes the security guard, 45 seconds to walk around here. You've got 30 seconds to pull the trick and 15 seconds to run. You know, you, you really, it really gets down to that. Um, and, and I think you do, and I still do to this day. I mean, I still believe I, I operate in a mode that is one of um, always, always, you know, when a cop drives by, I feel that I'm doing something wrong, even though I could just be sitting outside eating dinner. It doesn't even matter. I'm like, oh, they're, I'm busted. I'm like, oh, wait, I'm not doing any. I, you know, so I, it's, it's ingrained in me, and it's a way of being and existing. Um, and and I, I just think that, I, and I think going back to the street skating thing, I, I think that the way skaters approach uh, life is, is altered by the, the way they perceive um, you know, the objects around them, you know, like I will never look at a rail or a stairs or a ledge or anything the same way ever again for, until I'm six feet deep. And so therefore the way you approach life and the way you perceive it is going to be different no matter what. And that's one of the things that I believe leads to creativity, you know, whether it be the visual, the audible or the written. And cause it, cause it really creates this way of seeing completely differently. Yeah, the thing is you have to understand these guys are writing architecture that was not designed for them and so they're figuring out how can I adapt what I do to architecture that is not meant for me. And so what they end up doing is they end up drawing beautiful lines on, on buildings, on you know rails and stairs that has never been done prior to that. Now, I, I believe that most I, I believe most of you are entrepreneurs who have been involved in either uh, manufacturing or selling or generally promoting skating, skate equipment and all that kind of thing. H how are, how are uh, kids today different? Because you mentioned that you know street skaters are skating on surfaces not designed for them, but a lot of kids today have surfaces that are designed for them. And Do they grow up with a, a different mentality, do you think? Tony, do you want to take that? Um, well, I think that it's much more available to them now than it was to us. I mean, we really had to search out, you know, being being pool skaters, originally we had to search out empty swimming pools and the the very limited number of skate parks that were dwindling before our eyes as we as we were getting into it. So now I think that they, I don't want to say they take it for granted, but they know that those, those facilities are available to them, say skate park facilities, um, they know the spots to skate. They know that they're going to have other friends that will be skating there as well. And so the dynamics changed in that um, it's just more available to them, and and they know that. And so and so many more people speak their language than say for us. You know, we I, I'm sure most of us here we went to high school as complete outcasts. No one spoke your language. No one identified with what you did. And now there's there are plenty of kids that do that. And so there's a more sense of a belonging. Um, which isn't necessarily good or bad, but it's just a different uh, mindset now. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the interesting I'd like facts... To, I'd like to add one thing Tony sure. said. You know, because you're talking about the sports now coming up on 40 or 50 years of age, and as a result of that, there are middle-aged people now who did skateboard, and their kids skateboard, so it's accepted. When I was a kid, my parents had no concept what a skateboard was. They couldn't have because it didn't exist in their day. So that's also changing. Now, many of you guys are still pro skaters, right? Yes. They all are. How do you, how do you pull that off? That just seems like, you know, I mean, you're you know, uh, as I understand it, in, in Stacy's day, it was like a couple of years, and, and, and then that was the end of, you know, you're, you're, you're not a teenager anymore, so now it's time to become a award-winning filmmaker or something. So, so how do you, how do you ma manage to, to, to have a, you know, continue to be a pro skater? Well, I think it goes back to what Rodney said, is um, if it is all only athletics, then the younger guy will take you out. But if you have a creative mind, then you're going to constantly come up with things that are still catching someone's eye or thought. And if you can do that, then you can still have a position in skateboarding. And it also goes back to one of your initial statements of the irony that you become um, well-known 
and I see a lot of really good guys that, that have extraordinary horsepower and they have that motivation, they rise and then it's just like uh, they get what they wanted, I guess, what they thought they wanted and the next thing they know they cannot um, maintain a professional career because it really takes that, that motivation deep from inside and you have to nurture that and the only way you can do that is get gratification from what you do and not by what you get from it monetarily or approval wise but just that expression and that's I think the distinction of what we have in that Stacey is so deeply imbued in us. You know we're talking a lot about skateboarding here but I, I want to say one thing a lot of people who have seen the film say that although it takes place in the skateboarding world it's a story that transcends the sport and I think the reason it does that is because it's really the film ended up being a very interior look at the journey these guys took as very young kids in finding their own voices. And all of them, all six of them, found their voices. And they found their voices to be so strong that 30 years later, they are still involved in this sport as iconic athletes, as iconic skateboarders. And you can't say that about 90% of the skateboarders out there. A lot of the people that are seeing the film are calling it a chick flick because it's so, it, it's so sensitive and it deal, it's very emotional and it deals with what these guys went through as young kids, what Tony Hawk struggled with, what Rodney struggled with, what Lance struggled with, and what the other guys struggled with, and what their goals were. So although it takes place in the skateboarding world, it's really a story about six very young kids coming of age and, um, and finding what special gift that they each had and developing that gift. Now, how is this... Um a movie different from Dogtown and Z-Boys and Riding Giants in terms of uh, the kinds of things you just mentioned in terms of getting into the interior of the person and the people who, who are, are in the movie. Well, Dogtown was more about a movement and about the beginning of a culture. This film really is about this, these six individuals and their personal stories. Dogtown wasn't very personal. This is a much more personal story, and it's not necessarily a history of 80s skateboarding like Dogtown was kind of a cursory history of 70s skateboarding and how it kind of birthed out of surfing and went into the backyard pools. This is really a look, a psychological and emotional look at these guys as very young kids coming together and the strength that they found as a group because so many of them felt like outcasts and because they had such strong feelings to succeed. Just, and I think that's the, the most important thing is that's why I think that's kind of why I and maybe some of the other guys really hounded Stacy to make this thing because it was going to be made or a story about the 80s was going to be made or a story of people were talking about it and I know the footage was going to get used up and other people wanted to do it and we were just, Stacy's the only one that we thought wouldn't just tell the story of skateboarding and uh, really make it uh, apply to like anybody because everyone across the board has feelings and they also have emotions and they have they have desires in their lives of what they want to accomplish or not accomplish whether it be anything in life and uh, I just think um, Stacy put that together in a way that uh, just um, could supersede anything that anybody else could have done because they would have done a skateboard story. Now you guys all along were making all kinds of um, goofy and silly and some some really awesome like movies and shooting videos all the time I mean you guys were always had cameras pointed at you, um, you know, and and then in this movie you have a, a series of interviews interlaced with the kinds of things you're talking about. Um, how did that? How did those all the all those uh, uh, awesome movies you guys made in the in the past um, prepare you to sort of uh, kind of be on camera and open up, op you know, open up your you know interior thoughts and, you know, that, that sort of thing. You were going to say something. Oh. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Tony, Tony, do you want to take that? Uh, well, I think that we wouldn't have opened up nearly as much to anyone else but Stacy. So the fact that he was so deeply embedded in the story and that we trust him and we trust how he's going to put all the interweave all of our stories together, you know, that, that's the only way you're going to get a truly open, honest conversation with any of us. Um, with anyone else, we would, I think we would just feel guarded and we would feel like we can't give away too much because they're going to run with it and it's, it's not going to be the true story. Hmm. I was actually surprised that they 
allowed me to do the interviews because I figured, why would they want to talk to me? I was there with them at the time that I'm talking to them about. So the whole thing's been a real surprise to me. But once we sat down and began the interviews, these guys unloaded on me and opened up in a way that I never had anticipated and I never had expected. I never had expected that this film would have the legs that it has. It's been a total surprise to me. I think the use of the word autobiography in the title is brilliant because it really, um, I don't know, it just, it just it feels much more, makes a lot of sense. It clarifies the fact that, you know, that, that you, Stacey, are, are, are the filmmaker and also, well, it's, you know. It's, really, it's, it's, it's a collective autobiography. It's us yeah. telling our own yeah. story. Yeah. yeah. Well, you were going to say something. It's just, the movie does have a lot of depth, and the depth and breadth of it is proportional or representative of the length of our careers. And Stacy anchored us into that. He started it. And so just as Tony, it's exactly as Tony said, that we all get in front of the camera a lot. But what made us so absolutely unique is just talking to Stacy because he knew us as kids and he brought us back to that. And a lot of us had, I hadn't had much contact with Stacy for a long time. And coming back, I, I was amazed at myself at what came out. And I can't see that coming out for anybody but Stacy. Now, the biggest question I'm getting about this movie from the people I've been talking to o online is, when can I see it? What, what, <laughs> well, what, we what are your plans for distribution? We just returned from Sundance. We, we were accepted into the Sundance Festival. You know, when you get in there, you compete against 10,000 other films. We got chosen. In that week that we were at Sundance, we showed the film six times. We have a number of really, um, uh, what, what I would say, happy offers on this film. We, the problem, not the problem, the challenge is we, we are thinking in the, now in the digital age, we don't want to do this traditional. We want to do this non-traditional. My guess is the film will be out either in spring or early summer. That's my guess right now. Which but, but this spring, this spring or summer of 2012. But right at this moment, we're, we're, we're weighing all the offers, we're looking at them, and we're going to try to synchronize them in the best harmony that we can as far as how they should unfold. Okay. Um, we're getting close to the end here, but I, I wanted to, um, to just ask each of you, um, you know, what are you working on right now? What are the projects, either, either you know, professional business, philanthropic, or, or otherwise, um, just, just so your fans can, can catch up with you and, and, uh, and hear what you're working on? So why don't we start with you, Steve? Uh, well, first and foremost, uh, working on myself, my personality, and Finally, <laughs> <laughs> my behavior, um, just like looking into my heart, seeing what I need changing. Um, also, uh, continue skating, working on trying to keep the moves that we have because we are still competitive in a way. Now, you still skate for Powell, right? Yep, still ride for Powell Peralta and uh, actually got a competition in February in Australia. So uh, after this uh, premiere, I'll be going back home and, and working on, on that. You're, you're, working, that. you're working on the Cavalarium too, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're getting perfecting that, and then, uh, just doing, you know, doing art on the side as well, trying to perfect that as well. You you, you want to be able to do the Cavalario. That, that's that's key. Oh, also doing a demo at Google tomorrow. <laughs> that's right. You you had mentioned that earlier. You're going to be at Google's campus in Mountain View, right? Doing a demo. Yeah. So uh, it's pretty cool. That, that's 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 incredible. So uh, Steve, I, I I understand you're a musician. I used to be. Uh, I used to play uh, in a couple bands, uh, guitar and bass, but I don't really have time for that now, and I've actually changed uh, the cre creativity to uh, with a brush and pencil. So I'm just doing a lot of artwork now uh, to express my creative side. Okay. And Tommy, you are a musician, right? Yes. Um, I uh, founded was one of the founders with Jim Thebo of Real Skateboards 20 years ago. Um, and I'm still there pretty much every day. I was, I'm was i pretty much running one of the companies called Crooked, which is uh, Mark Gonzalez is a figurehead, and I do a lot of layout and design and have been for a while. But on the other side of that as well, I play music and um, just working on another record, I think my ninth solo album. And uh, my son just got into skating. He's, he'll be eight in April, so he's been pulling me back into it. We've been going to some skate parks and stuff. And so I'm... Uh, yeah, I'm super excited about that. That's super fun. And we use about eight of Tommy's songs in the film. Really? Yeah, that work beautifully in the film. That's great. Yeah. Uh, and Mike, uh, what are you doing? Uh, let's see. Uh, <laughs> why, why 
what am I not doing? Uh, well, I run my own skateboard shop you know, mm -hmm. for the last, uh, this is our 23rd year. And, um, and then I have a family, of course. And my oldest son, who's 10, Merrick, he, uh, he skates a little bit, so we, uh, we go to the park. And then I, uh, I uh, also designed some like mass market skateboards and safety equipment and stuff for uh, bigger box stores. That's pretty challenging for me because usually I'm the only guy in there that skates, you know. Yeah. Now you, you've you've um, you've probably seen your share of horrific injuries over the years. Did that inspire you to work on safety equipment? Ah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It was always that one last run that did. Um, yeah. You know, I don't. I don't know. I uh, I you know I, I try you know the kids that come through my store and dads. I mean I get dads all the time coming. Say, hey, you know, I've seen Rodney lately, or Lance, or Tommy, or Tom, you know, and I'm I, I am exhausted telling them all the time what these guys are doing. <laughs> so uh, hopefully they'll be able to see this. Right now you can just now you can just tell them to go see the movie. That's right. That's right. <laughs> okay, and uh, Lance. Um, I'm just blessed to be able to still make money skateboarding. That's what I do. <laughs> and. Uh, Skateboard as much as I can. Uh, spend as much time as I can with my wife now because um, things are a lot nicer than they were for years with the rat race of trying to run businesses and stuff. And um, yeah, I just skateboard and I, in the middle of trying to film a video part, that's what I did. Skateboard. Okay, and and Rodney. I I had a business for a long time. I, I started with a friend and. We ran that for a decade or so and sold it and then kept going and sold it again essentially. And the intensity of between the business and maintaining sort of procreate switching to street skating was so much that I did neglect a lot of other parts of my life, including friends, stuff like that. So now I do things, I stepped aside from the business and I do more project based stuff. I work with trucks and concave boards and the technology involved. Um, and then I spend, I actually spend a lot of time just nurturing my friendships and hanging out with my wife and, and, and uh, trying to change something infrastructural to my skating so um, so I can look at it with fresh eyes. I, I understand that you've sw you, late in your life you sw you're switching your stance. Yeah, that's, that's, that's an endeavor again. It's an infrastructural change brought about by medieval means. <laughs> 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 Well, it sounds painful. <laughs> and and and, uh, and Stacy, um, we we know what you're working on. You're working on this movie. Um, what are you going to be working on after after this thing is uh, released into the wild? Well, the thing is, there, there's three parts to making a film. There's getting the money to make the film, which is a career in itself. There's making the film, which is a career in itself, and then there's releasing the film. I've got a lot of work ahead of me in the next six months in releasing this film. A lot of press to do. A lot of work to do, so um, I've got to kind of keep myself open to that. All on your own, all on your own. Yeah, all on my own. These guys are going to bail once this interview is done. They're gone. <laughs> and, and Tony, what are you doing in Australia? Uh, I'm actually on tour uh, at a, a concert tour called Big Day Out, and um, I guess I'm one of the headlining acts, but we have a ramp like right next to the main stage. So bands like Kanye West, Soundgarden are playing, and we're skating in between. And, um, other than that, I, uh, I helped to curate a new YouTube channel called Ride Channel, mm -hmm. and a lot of new skate footage, a lot of new content. Um, I actually just released my own video part on there uh, a couple days ago, so I'm pretty psyched on that. Oh. And other than that, doing a video game. And it, it, is that uh, video game something you... Go ahead, Rodney. Your part was insane. Best, best <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was crazy. So it took, that, that one uh, I put a lot of heart and soul into. It took a long time to get some of those tricks on video. You can see and it. I never oh, want to do them really, again. We really missed you at Sundance. Yeah. We had a great time. Ooh. I know. I, got, I, kept getting, uh, I kept getting torturous, torturous texts and updates from Sean Mortimer, who was there with you guys. None of us, nobody wanted to go to sleep. We stayed up every night till about 4 in the morning <laughs> telling stories. <laughs> Lance That's and Tommy and Rodney had us on the floor. <laughs> That's you. awesome. I wish I wish I could have been there. Yeah. <laughs> What's that? I could tell you were following us because you kept liking our Instagrams. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. 
<laughs> well, um, congratulations on this movie. It, uh, it sounds like an absolutely incredible film. Uh, and it just feels like something's going to break out and become something that really goes into the mainstream culture. And congratulations on all of your uh, successes and uh, everything else, and thank you so much for taking the time to do this uh, hangout with us. And, uh, again, you guys are, are legendary, and um, and I uh, wish you all the best, and I uh, hope this, this uh, movie is a ginormous success. Thanks for having us on. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Thanks, thank thanks you. Mike, for teaching me how to do a hangout. <laughs> I'll be on Google Plus now. I'm there. Every, everybody's circle. I'm going to be sending the circle of everybody, uh, or one of these guys who's on Google Plus, so you can uh, circle them and follow them, including Tony and Stacy and all the rest. So, cool. thanks again, everybody. And uh, this uh, concludes the Flying cir Circle with the legendary Bones Brigade. Thank you very much. All right, thanks.